future trends, deep insights, industry leaders. This is the iGaming Next podcast with your host, Pierre Lint. All right, Julian, Julian, uh, how's it going? Good to see you back here. Good to see you as well, Pierre. Happy to be here. Yes, happy to be here, but under circumstances that are not perhaps the most fun uh, at the moment for, for Malta. We're discussing the grey listing here today in this emergency podcast uh, based on the uh, news yesterday that uh, the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF, uh, decided to basically put Malta on their grey list, uh, uh, essentially. So... Uh, you know, so let's just jump straight into it, Hedjo. What, what does this uh, mean? What, what does this grey list uh, mean? What, what is the FATF? So I think, look, first, first off, even though I think most of us saw this coming, right? It still comes as a shock when you actually get the result, right? It's, uh, it's almost like an exam where you kind of know you haven't done really well, but you still <laughs> keep hoping that something goes through, right? Because the exam you just did. Uh, you you passed, and I think this was this was a shock for most of us, even though the, the writing was on the wall. I think I think the biggest uh, impacts won't be felt now, right? Let's be clear. This is a long term play, and uh, the, I still remain cautiously optimistic that if we work hard over the next few months, maybe years, we might be able to get back onto the white list, right? So hopefully, be there. I guess the interesting thing is an awareness of what fat actually is, right? Because most of us didn't know what it was until a few weeks ago. And then there was massive aggressive lobbying to try and ensure we remained on the white list. But sadly, that was not the case, even though the, the result actually isn't official. It will only be official in the coming days, right? I think they'll go, they'll publish it at the close of play on Friday the 25th. But there is, it's just a rubber stamping exercise, right? For, for all intents and purposes. Malta, and if I understand correctly, also Romania, will be two countries, uh, the two first uh, European countries, first put on the FATFA grey list. Exactly. And uh, let's just uh, start by definitions here. So like, uh, what is this uh, grey list? Like, who are the FATF? And uh, um, what does this grey li listing mean in principles? So, so first off, this is not uh, an iGaming specific uh, metric, right? It's not even it's not even something which uh, most countries bothered about. FATF has been around, if I'm not mistaken, about 40 years, right? It actually was uh, around before MoneyVal, which effectively is a European uh, European-based uh, committee. FATF is essentially a financial action task force, right? Its main remit is to ensure that there isn't any money laundering or, or illicit uh, funding, such as terrorist activities happening under the jurisdictions uh, where, where money passes, i.e. where there are the banks, right? So FATF effectively has three levels, right? There's white, where you'd want to be, because effectively it means you have been rubber stamped and sealed for approval. There is gray, which Malta has unfortunately been put into together with, I think, 19 other countries. And we'll get into those in a bit. And there's currently two in the blacklist. There also exists a blacklist, right? And blacklist are specific territories, which uh, are, uh, are no-go areas for, uh, for global funds for various reasons, mostly political, but sometimes also other reasons as well. Those two territories right now are Iran and North Korea. Right? So the majority of, of the world's economies sit under the white list. There are, uh, there are let's say, 20-ish uh, territories, uh, which effectively mostly are developing countries. I think it's important for us to, to think that until yesterday, um, uh, more than Romania were considered to be in the, in the white list. And then, obviously, in, in the blacklist, there are territories which effectively have sanctions, complete sanctions, not just by FAT, but by the United Nations placed on them. So I guess the implications of FAT with more being placed on the grid, this is all of a sudden, this is massive spotlight, just similar to what Iceland had a couple of years ago, where effectively now every single move, whether it's banking, whether it's legislative, whether it is sometimes even political, is highly scrutinized. And that obviously creates a lot of pressure for everyone concerned, if that makes sense. Right, right. So it's the uh, it's the optics here for the kind of individual organizations, uh, for example, that are operating uh, from Malta uh, that uh, potentially can be damaging, uh, right? Uh, so, so if you're an iGaming company, for example, and uh, you're you're based in Malta, the optics from the rest of the world to do business with you, uh, being operated from a great listed company, is what can affect these organizations negatively. As as an example of of this uh, uh, of this list, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And right now, honestly speaking, it, we're an uncharted territory. 
both both for Moon, but also for specifically for us for the gaming community, right? Because we've never really entered into such a situation. We don't know what will happen, right? That's the, I guess the honest truth. And anybody who speculates that right. uh, you know, immediately and either highly optimistic or highly pessimistic, the truth is it's probably somewhere in between, right? What we do know is there's going to be a lot of pain, particularly on the auditing and the due diligence side, to get actually things done, which, uh, as anyone knows, has actually tried ever to get a bank account or a certification and more done or even, even an, an electricity connection to their place is incredibly time consuming on, on the best of times. So I can only imagine that we are going to be subjected to a significantly more amount of pain, at least until the pressure wears off. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that is something we can definitely share as experts uh, uh, here and, and the founding of companies. It's uh, starting a bank account in Malta is just one of those things that has always been uh, an issue here, but uh, more so the last, you know, something like 18 months or so, uh, during the process where Malta was effectively going through this process of uh, uh, trying to better itself to be able right. to be approved by Manuel well, and, and now the FATF uh, in order to not be uh, grey listed. And I know, you know, this has been um, behind the door, so to say. This has been um, this has been a process that has been ongoing for our, for for some time, and a lot of organizations that are that are based here have been discussing contingencies you know if Malta gets carry listed what do we do right. what will this mean for the for the island and so on and so forth so for many of them this is not a it, even though it might be a surprise that Malta ended up on the gray list I guess a lot of organizations are not uh, unprepared for uh, this uh, happening so to say uh, I think that's but, correct uh, I, yeah, yeah 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 go ahead I think I, I think that's correct and I think and you're absolutely right. Over the last 18, I would even say 24 months, there has been a significant amount of effort, right, on all parties concerned to expedite processes to make them more transparent, particularly on audits. Oh, this is a classic case in point. The audits section of the industry has actually been working extremely hard over the last couple of years to ensure that when you get to backdate audits or actually look in retrospective towards audits, were they done according to practice, according to GAP, according to YFRS? And the answer is yes, right? So I guess in many ways, there's been a subconscious preparation for this, whether it's been from the top and from legislative and the various uh, industries to the to the bottom. But it still comes at a shock, right? And uh, especially for new entrants into this market, right? For new foreign direct investment, for new companies thinking about setting up shop in Malta, that's a significant challenge. Yeah. So for the iGaming industry specifically, I mean, um, uh, let's take the, um, let's start with, you know, the major listed organizations, uh, the, the likes of the Evolutions, the Betsons, the Leo Vegas, uh, the Kindred, so on and so forth, uh, that are, that have their home in Malta, they are domiciled in, in Malta. Yep. Do you see any major impact or potential major impact that, um, that this grey listing can have on this, on this tier one organization, let's say, especially being listed and, yeah. So that's, a good, that's part of the good news, right? The, the truth is there probably won't be anything happening in the short term. And, uh, and the reality is that even, even if you had to pivot very aggressively, right, to a new jurisdiction, especially with a public listed organization, that takes time, right? And right now there isn't sufficient grounds to suggest that there will need to be an, an aggressive pivot, um, whether you have a company that's uh, that's fully cited in Malta that needs to move elsewhere, whether it's a company that has MGA licenses needs to be reclassified elsewhere. Right now, the evidence doesn't seem to suggest, but again, we are in uncharted territory. So I think we need to, well, I, I would assume that the chief risk officers of every single one of these large organizations right now are preparing very detailed prospectuses of uh, low, medium, high, uh, high worst case scenarios, whereby which the companies then need to start aligning, right? So I was, I was in the UK when Brexit happened, right? So we went through this whole process of what about the differences between soft and hard Brexit, right? So I think a lot of preparations had already happened by the time Britain was fully ejected from yeah. the European Union. This is not that dissimilar. Right? There is a certain level of uh, reclassification that will have impact on certain things like licensing and banking. Right? For the other, what I call more intangibles like real estate and whatnot, that probably is a longer term drawn out. And it actually depends on how long Malta will remain in the grey list uh, category, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's uh, interesting to, to hear. So that is another uh, perspective here as well, right? Which is like, how long will Malta be on this uh, grey list? And you mentioned Iceland uh, here earlier, which uh, which had a stint on this grey list for about a year. 
And uh, I don't know many details, but what I read is that during this year on the gray list, um, there was a uh, heavy financial impact on the yeah. on the nation. I don't know yes. if there's any more context that you can bring to what happened to Iceland and if there's any similarities to what yeah. is now happening in Malta. So it's actually important to draw in parallels with Iceland because Iceland bears a lot of similarities to Malta. So first off, uh, Iceland is an island economy, right? What that means yeah. is that other, other than raw materials and tourism, there's very little that uh, a small island with a small GDP in terms of its raw produce can actually contribute to an economy. So that's when economies pivot to services. So Malta did this almost 20, 30 years ago. Iceland did this actually 20 years ago with banking. So in fact, uh, in the early noughties, some of the biggest uh, corporations actually had headquarters in, uh, in Zug and in, and in Reykjavik for, for these kind of reasons. And Iceland was hit, hit very badly by, uh, by the first uh, banking recession, purely because it got caught short and was overextended. And I think a lot of learning happened uh, in that regard. So when, when it was grey listed in, at the end of 2019, there was a very aggressive push by the government to remove any links to anti-money laundering, to money laundering, right? So their AML stance was jumped up and they did some very simple things, right? Like make, ensure uh, all your UBOs, your ultimate beneficiary owners are clearly listed. They are humans, they are not corporations. So there's easily a little bit of traceability. And that was a really big fast track. And it actually worked really well in Iceland's favor because then on the next plenary of the FATF, uh, which actually happened a year later, they actually said, look, You've done a good job, you've complied with what we want, we'll take you off the list. So it almost felt in hindsight like a wrist slapping exercise. But as, yeah. as you mentioned, Iceland's economy suffered, suffered even in the year that it was grey listed. And the, the reason is less direct and more indirect, right? That's the sentiment that is caused as a result of that. Should we invest in Iceland? Should this be uh, something that we think of as a long term prospect? And actually, that is where Malta is right now, right? So the, the, the the reality is very similar. It's less, the, the, the short term risks are less financial. They are more of sentiment. And sentiment, as we all know, drives markets. And it drives mm. uh, investment. It drives whether you want to buy that new car. It drives whether you actually want to buy that new house that's on the market and you've over overbid for it. That affects a lot of things, right? And because, because economy cycles are long drawn, the longer they take, the, the faster the momentum. The faster the momentum, the more the effects on the economy. So it actually right. is is self reinforcing to an extent, right? Right, right, and and uh, it kind of feeds into that narrative a bit that uh, Malta has been seen uh, on a global stage as a questionable jurisdiction in in in, in, in some ways, um, associating itself with uh, you know gambling, which you know right or wrong is seen as a as a questionable industry, uh, as well as um, trying to be kind of the blockchain island, which uh, which is also yes. seen as a bit of a questionable industry. Uh, and um, uh, it feeds into also the narrative of the passport scheme and the Correct. fact and corporate, uh, corporate tax and, and stuff like that. And, and in fact, it's important to outline this. Mm. History will look back on, on, on this chapter and, and ask themselves, why was Malta grey listed, right? Irrespective of how long it's going to take. And the reality is there is not one thing, right? This is a gradual layering of, let's call them small, or, or grey offences, right? At that one point, yeah. uh, tip the cameras back. The, the, the reality is when you look at the, the, the plenary committee, right? The countries that actually voted, right? The biggest players that voted against more, there were Britain, so the UK, right? Germany yeah. and, and the US, right? So in, in, in the greater scheme of things, uh, the, the list of, uh, let's call them schoolboy offences that Malta should have done over the last 10 years clearly must have irritated these three players primarily, right? So we can only surmise it must be due to the passport scheme because we do know that both the US and UK and especially Germany opposed passport schemes a lot. Um, uh, the 5% taxation rule, which the US now, especially with the Democrats, have actually been very aggressively trying to remove, particularly with, uh, with the most recent move at the G7. And actually, in, in many ways, uh, it's almost in timing, right, that uh, that happened after the G7 because the G7 unanimously voted to remove low tax jurisdictions, right? Actually, uh, enable enable a minimum taxation of fifteen percent across all jurisdictions, and then uh, it so happens that a few weeks later they end up voting on Malta's fate, it being a five percent jurisdiction. So I think yeah. actually one of one of the one of the low hanging fruit will actually be to remedy that, right? And that we can talk about we can talk about what should be the next steps to be uh, probably la later on on this session. 
But yeah. the, the point is, when you when you when you factor in the passport scheme, when you factor in the the, the the taxation element, when you factor in that, let's be honest about it, we have to mention that a journalist was murdered uh, in the last yeah. four years for actually talking about money laundering, right? And we do suspect, and the the the, the whole the whole uh, the whole island suspects, uh, together with the whole journalistic uh, industry, that this was actually related to money laundering. Then, unfortunately, um, uh, I think the powers that we cannot afford not to take a specific moral stand on ensuring that these things are properly rectified, that uh, the perpetrators are properly seen to, and importantly, the island is seen on a recovery. So there's a psychological and political uh, movement to this, as well as the underlying financial reasons why uh, a jurisdiction right. like Malta would be put on the grey list. Right, we have to uh, take a step back in order to take two steps forward, let's say that. But uh, you mentioned something interesting uh, uh, here, Julian, which is the, uh, the G7 meeting that took place uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it's essentially, to summarize uh, here a bit, as you said, it's, um, it's the wish of the G7 to kind of harmonize the tax, uh, the, the corporate tax rates. Or not harmonize them, but to set a minimum threshold of uh, 15%, yes. essentially. And that would obviously affect uh, Malta's uh, tax scheme, which is... Um, uh, there's a tax scheme of of five uh, percent corporate tax on uh, on international business uh, here, which yes. uh, have obviously fueled the economy uh, in Malta. Uh, again, being one of these incentives to uh, to create the, these industries that we have seen popping up now over the over the last uh, fifteen or so years. Um, yes. There's also the blockchain so, element, right? Let's let's be right. clear. And, and it's so ironic. We're talking about this the day after one of the key speakers at the blockchain conference was actually found uh, dead in his cell, right? So John McAfee was actually invited to the blockchain conference, the very first blockchain wow. conference on the island, and he was arrested for money laundering charges and and tax evasion. Wow. And as, and yeah, yesterday, like... so this is all related, right? This 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 almost right. this this karma esque. Uh, yeah. play ha are happening right now around the fact that the world is a very different uh, is a very different playing ground today than even it was 10 15 years ago right 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 and, uh, yeah exactly it's such a fast moving space the uh, the the crypto blockchain space that is just exploding and, and regulators obviously trying to catch up and um, when this space was even earlier malta you know committed itself to be this blockchain island and it's kind of coming back to bite uh, the island a, a little bit uh, at the moment um, to stay on on uh, on iGaming specifically, uh, now Julian, what do you think could be some of the um, repercussions here for the iGaming industry uh, in in Malta? What do you think could potentially happen? Again, we are speculating here, and there's no certainties at the moment. But how do you, how do you think this could affect the various organizations here? Again, some good news. In the short term, I don't think there's going to be uh, much yeah. effect, particularly with those uh, with those companies who already, thankfully, have a bank account, have an MGA license, are are licensed with the MFSA, and uh, and probably have done a the FIA uh, due diligence test. So that will probably be business as usual, right? For any other companies which are either ongoing a certification process, right, or have just started their audits, or are just applying for uh, for a bank account, things get a little bit more complicated. Right, so we know we know that the process has started to slow down significantly, because effectively the services industry was overheating. There was way too much demand, and uh, let's be honest about it: little supply or, or insufficient supply to service all all the demand. So for for the gaming companies, including the publicly listed companies that effectively already have a, a running machine here that shouldn't affect them in the short term right uh, it will affect uh, jurisdictions or companies uh, looking to set up shop in Malta because that effectively will affect the decisions we saw that with Iceland something similar will happen in Malta if if you do have some new high net worth deciding to invest in a business deciding to apply for an MGA license deciding to apply for a Malta Topco that probably is going to affect your decision that probably will affect your decision now right and that's where sentiment kicks in and then, assuming the whole grey list uh, solu uh, situation doesn't resolve itself in the medium term, then even existing companies will actually start to have challenges. First off, because of, of, of the actual audits themselves and the necessary backdated due diligence uh, and compliance requirements. Expect to see more of this over the coming months, uh, possibly even years, depending how long we stay here. That will affect gaming companies. What's also more more important, and again, this is a developing story, so we're not fully aware of how it will play out, is what is the relevancy of an MGA license, right? In uh, in in a, in a world that now sees a Malta a Malta territory as as grey listed. Will there be some pressure, particularly from shareholders, particularly the more active? Uh, uh, 
shareholders or, or hedge funds to be able to pivot away from an MGA license and look for something more suitable. What's for sure is Grey Listing has definitely devalued the MGA's uh, classification as a reputable global brand for which to go gaming, which unfortunately is not directly the MGA's fault, but we are where we are. Um, similar with MFSA, right? If, if you are effectively looking for a business which is not necessarily owning a gaming license, but a top code that owns a business that owns a gaming license, you need to go to an MFSA certification. That itself will have implications. Why should I go to that hassle? Only to get what, uh, what the Europeans and the US will see as a second tier uh, status. So that will affect the pressure. And, and that's actually when the side effects of economies kick in, right? Uh, negative sentiments start to permeate. All of a sudden, businesses start to question why they need to be there. Probably prices might come down because of less demand or because of, uh, let's be honest, speculation actually will start to go down. Some good things will come out. So uh, you will be able to get more competitive rates on, uh, on what I call fixed goods and assets purely because there'll be less demand. But the reality is that the corporations will start to think whether Malta will remain a sufficient jurisdiction for them. So, right. so best example best example is Portugal, for instance, right? We know uh, even over the last few years, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of gaming has actually pivoted to Portugal and to the south of Spain, right? There's a lot there's a lot of demand happening there. There's uh, there's some good tax incentives on the island, right? There's good tax incentives for, <laughs> for anyone moving moving to Portugal. This is why this is not just one thing, right? There's a number of layered things that actually make a country great. This. Um, right. But the truth is that all of a sudden, the economies of scale for the big public listed companies will start to put in question. And again, the CROs and the CFOs of these various public of these various public listed companies at some point are going to put down their uh, their reports for saying Malta versus Portugal, Malta versus Spain. What are the pros and cons if they haven't started doing them already? Right, and um, this is a lot of the um, discussions that I've heard being talked about kind of in the corridors of the last uh, two years is, uh, you know, if, if the island gets grey listed, uh, what do we do? And um, the discussions have been, you know, are we, are we going to move as an organization? Um, uh, you know, the organizations is, are already, um, uh, over the last couple of years, have already started growing, well, some of the organizations have already started growing their teams abroad, so to say, even though they still have the, um, uh, the head of CC Malta, some of the development teams, CS, other teams are uh, being established uh, abroad, of course. Um, what about on the on the ESG side of things, Julian? So uh, again, if you, if we bring up the the listed companies here, um, is this a potential ESG issue as well, being associated to a grey listed uh, a, a grey listed nation? So say that you are domiciled. In, 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 a, in a country that is uh, that is grey listed, can I reflect bad on a, on an organization from an ESG point of view? Again, it will probably come down to a long term play because we're entering mm -hmm. uncharted territory. It's difficult yeah. to assess how much of a, of a, of an influence an ESG play is going to have here. However, in the right. long term, yes. If, if if for instance, hypothetically speaking, Malta is still in grey list status after five years, it's reasonable to assume that anybody that's set up here because of good banking, because of a clean a clean bill of health, right, and importantly, uh, ability to move money freely throughout Europe. Then we start to question those motives, right? And mm -hmm. and the, the the biggest issue is this: when you see when you see grey listed countries, right, that all, all of a sudden get that grey listing, the good the good companies tend to move quicker than the others, right? And when the good companies move out, who's left behind, right? So mm -hmm. actually, and and this this actually is possibly the thing that worries me the most, right? It, it it doesn't worry me that we're on we're on a path to recovery because we get smack on the wrist. Malta has always shown to be quite quite well at reacting well. Malta is not, uh, not particularly good strategic wise, but it's good reactionary wise. When something happens, Malta can react quickly to it. So I'm sure there'll be this, uh, this, this uh, let's call them this project whitelist committee, right? Ensuring that we can get on the road to survival. The worry isn't that, the worry is that if that process takes long for various reasons, right? And we know that there have been countries on the grey list that have attempted to come out of the grey list, but are still there. The biggest issue is the, the ripple effect of good companies leaving only be to, to be supplanted by let's say not so good companies insisting on staying here because hey uh, it's cheap to come in uh, it's cheap to set up and uh, nobody's really gonna gonna to pay a lot of attention to us because we can sit under the radar that's the biggest effect if that makes sense right uh, and it's a, it's a good point uh, that you mentioned here i mean the, the island is small and it's it works sometimes against malta but it also works for malta in the, in the sense yeah. here that uh, that things can change quickly but what do you think as a, as a little final question today um or a second final, i have one last final as well actually but 
what do you think it will take for Malta to get back on the whitelist? I mean, you would assume that the, Malta has already worked really hard over the last couple of years to ensure uh, a whitelisting, and still it, 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 it became graylisted. So that means that you would assume that uh, there will be some pretty heavy concessions that Malta will have to make on various schemes in order to get back on the whitelist. Like, what's your best guess it, there, it, it, It's a good question. I generally think they'd be split into, into a few categories, right? But what I can see is that the tax rate, uh, the, the effective foreign tax rate will have to be increased to at least 15%. That is what uh, has been established at, uh, at the right. recent G7 conference. To be fair, most auditing companies in Malta have had expressed concern a lot that this 5% was going to come back and bite us. And I think it's a low hanging fruit. We increase that. It might actually be a bargaining chip quickly. I actually think the passport scheme will have to be scrapped. I think there'll be significant pressure on it to uh, to be scrapped now because it was definitely one of the issues that upset the US the most and possibly the UK because the UK media has always been about the passport scheme. I also mm -hmm. think that there will be a more clear reporting structure around multi UBOs and the so-called double companies, right? That you have a Tropco, uh, which is a multi company, and the Nopco, which is a multi company, and the whole structure around that. These are all auditing things. Are there anything related to gaming? No, not directly, but they will affect how quickly multi can get back onto the bargaining table. And it has to seed some territory, particularly in this regard, right? Um, yeah. On the gaming side, possibly around uh, around tax harmonization, but that is a very, it's a Pandora's box. Tax harmonization implies that uh, it will need to be in line with the European hard taxation laws. And Cyprus went through this uh, in the last uh, recession. It did affect the, 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 the country significantly. So Cyprus had to get, in order to get a specific amount of funding, of emergency funding, they had to relinquish a lot of things that affect hedge funds, which were stationed in the island at the time. And arguably, they still haven't recovered from that effect. I can't see Mould actually succeeding to this unless uh, this uh, grayless situation becomes long drawn out. And as we all know, the longer things take when you're in a non-bargaining position, the more you are willing to cede in order to get back to the bargaining table. But all this will be affected uh, depending on how the economy performs. Most has always been a very services-driven economy if the services economy doesn't appear to be as, uh, as affected over the next six to 12 months as speculators think they are, there might be a stronger bargaining chip, right? I mean, this, the positive situation will be on this, the, the very positive situation will be that uh, this is business as usual, nothing is wrong, we just have a different color associated to one of our lists and it's business as usual, guys, carry on as before, right? The other extreme is it's all, it's the end of the world and uh, we're all gonna close up shop. The reality is it's probably somewhere in between. We do need to work hard at this because it's gonna get worse as, as it progresses, if that makes sense. Let's let's just say that there's uh, there's uh, many different shades of grey. There's fifty shades of grey, perhaps, and uh, the, and the, you, you can put yourself uh, in any of those shades that you as you wish to see this situation. <laughs> so, so finally, <laughs> last last but not least, then uh, Julian, uh, is there anything that can be positive that we can draw out from this? You know, what, what is yes. like let's say the out of these fifty shades of grey, what is the lightest uh, shade of grey perspective here that we can take on this situation? I I actually think this is quite important because I think there's some there's some positivity that can that can come out of this. I think the awareness is the first one, right? Why yeah. and how has this happened, and why and, and how can we actually uh, remedy, remedy ourselves? So it goes down to us as gaming professionals, right? But it also goes to the obligations placed on us by our service providers, right? If we all if we all work together to ensure that uh, we can report harmoniously our work, we can effectively uh, show clarity on what is stated and what isn't. On if we can uh, put more pressure on the powers that be to make certain changes, I generally think we should all move to a fifteen percent um, uh, tax company taxation. Uh, it's it's a quick win, and it generally it's going to go a long way to to proving Walter's repentance to get back to the list. But also put pressure on other things, right? I mean, I I personally think that the passport scheme is a very bad thing because I genuinely think it's uh, not at a level of diligence that sadly will allow uh, uh, an entity like the US or the UK to look favorably on us. There's obviously different camps of that, but I for one would say, look, citizenship is not something that you can buy, right? It is something that you earn over time with rights. And uh, I think it should be a low hanging fruit. And I'm hoping that this becomes uh, a movement for uh, for us as, as uh, 
as individuals to place an active pressure for this to happen. Now, now we're all in this, right? This is not something which is just affecting a remote section of, of the population. This is us as individuals who have been affected by a, juris uh, a jurisdiction's determination. We can work together to actually get some good out of this. And the first thing is awareness. Awareness, and second thing is use your voice, if, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, again, to wrap it up, it's, we, you know, we can see it as a, as a, as a one step forward, uh, one step back in order to take two steps forward. I think that is the best uh, way to see it uh, uh, here. And if Malta kind of gets its act together uh, here in the long run, this can be something positive for the, for the island, uh, although it's a short term um, uh, pain, let's say. Um, Julian, thank you so much for uh, doing this uh, emergency podcast uh, now on very, very short notice. So in, uh, I messaged you this uh, 30 minutes before you jumped on. This is no preparation. We, uh, and I'm uh, always glad that, uh, that you can do this thing to, to bring some insights to, to the audience on this very important uh, topic. So thank you so much for, for today again, Julian. Thank you for having me, Pierre. Thank you. Thank you.